My name is Colette Haywood. I am a community activist and a resident of Vine City in Atlanta. When you think of Atlanta, it's often referred to as the Black Mecca. However, we only highlight two histories, that of the Confederacy and also civil rights. But what about hap what happened in between? For an example of what I'm referring to, all you have to do is take a look at Historic Oakland Cemetery. You're, you're getting on my nerves. Come on, let's find the rest. This is not it. Why is that not it? It says Slave Square. It clearly says Slave Square. Yeah, but this isn't it. There are more like... How can it not be it when it's the sign is there for a reason? There's a picture. No, okay, you got to read the markers. The markers will tell you. I don't think this is it. No, it's too prominent. It's not. I created the Legacy Keeper program for youth in Vine City so that I could teach um, our young people our history before it's being overlooked or destroyed by gentrification as the city is changing. And we here on the west side in neighborhoods like Vine City, Ashview Heights, West End, English Avenue, we often refer to the West Side as the soul of Atlanta. ...and trying to save our neighborhood. So, um, like from that video we watched last time about what they're doing in Lamarck Park, like them telling the history of things and why it's imperative that we do these things, like document our stories so we can, when other people try to come into the spaces and push us out, we can say this is what's here and this is why it's important that we preserve it. So not only are we addressing the issues of gentrification, we're also um, shedding light on why this space and this area means so much to us. And the historical value that it has for black people and for all people in Atlanta because Atlanta was a hub for black people to come and become prosperous. So a lot of people might not know that and they're about to sweep all this stuff out. Georgia's cotton planters relied upon the labor of enslaved African American people. Accordingly, the population of Georgia included some 462,198 slaves, which equal 44% of the state's total population. The Zero Mile Post was installed to mark the end of the Western and Atlantic Railroad. The town that grew up around it was called Terminus and was renamed Marthasville in 1843 and several years later was renamed Atlanta. At the start of the Civil War in 1861, Atlanta was a major railroad hub and center for manufacturing vital to southern commerce and transportation and became the target of a major union campaign. Understanding its importance, in September 1864, General William T. Sherman and his Union forces captured the city. This victory helped President Abraham Lincoln win re-election. General Sherman ordered that Atlanta be burned to the ground so that the Confederate Army could not build supplies. He continued his scorch and burn policy as he marched to Savannah, Georgia. Afterwards, Atlanta lay in ruins. After several decades, Atlanta rebuilt itself as a center for civil rights and as a vibrant economic powerhouse. On January 1st, 1863, Four million slaves were freed by President Abraham Lincoln's executive order 
the Emancipation Proclamation. As soon as a slave escaped the control of the Confederate government by running away or through advances of federal troops, the slave became legally free. The proclamation did not cover slaves in Union areas that were freed by state action. Freedmen was the term given to those slaves who became free men. As troops advanced, slaves sought refuge in Union camps, and federal commanders were confused over their obligations to the refugees. Some freed the slaves, others sent them back to their master for lack of means to care White for White America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Uh, that is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made the Negroes color a stigma. America freed the slaves in 19, I mean 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate. And therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, oh, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps, but uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. The Reconstruction Era was the period from 1863 to 1877 following the American Civil War and includes the attempted transformation of the 11 ex-Confederate states as directed by Congress. My name is Fountain Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. After we got freed and they turned us out like cattle, and we, could, we didn't have nowhere to go. And we didn't have nobody to boss us. And uh, we didn't know nothing. And there, wasn't, there was no school. And when they started the little school, uh, people that were slaves, they couldn't many of them go to school, except they had a father and a mother. And my father was dead, and my mother was living. And she had three, four other little children, and she had to put them all to work for, to help take care of the other. So we had, well, we had what you call worse than dogs have got it now. The dogs have got it now better than we had it when we come along. We had no property, we didn't have no home. We had nowhere, nothing, we didn't have nothing, you know, just to, like your cattle, we were just turned out and uh, get along the best you could. Nobody to look after us. We've been slaves all our lives. My mother was a slave, my sister was a slave, my father was a slave. If I thought, had any idea, that I'd ever be a slave again, I'd take a gun and just end it all right away. On January 16, 1865, uh, Sherman Booth had reached Savannah. He was accompanied, or his troops were accompanied by so many of the freedmen because of the Emancipation Proclamation that it was slowing down the army and he needed some relief. 
So he met with the black leaders in Savannah to ask them, what can we do? How, how can we alleviate this problem? And what the leaders told him is that they needed assistance so that they could sustain himself. So um, Sherman arranged that a strip of land that the Union Army had confiscated from the Confederates uh, going from, I believe, Charleston all the way to Florida was 400 acres. They decided to distribute uh, that land in 40 acre plots to the freedmen and uh, they issued Special Order 15 to accomplish that. Today we refer to it as 40 acres and a mule. And, a mule. and this all led to the formation of the Freedmen's Bureau, which came under the Department of War. And what the Freedmen's Bureau was uh, intended to do was to assist freedmen as they transitioned from slavery to freedom. It, and they accomplished this, uh, they established a Freedmen's Bank. They uh, distributed food, they distributed, uh, well, they made sure that the uh, slaves received an education. That was the purpose of it. They were overseeing labor contracts, and they also, the Union troops, provided protection to the former slaves. All of these services greatly facilitated the very difficult transition from slavery to freedom for millions of black Southerners. Unfortunately, in 1872, the Congress decided to abolish the Freedmen's Bureau. Even though the needs of many of the former slaves remained acute and the services and institutions that the Freedmen's Bureau had provided were crucial to the future of these new black citizens in the southern states. Why did the Congress eliminate the Freedmen's Bureau, especially since it had been doing such good work for over seven years? Well, largely because Northern sentiment, and especially in the Congress, had grown tired of the expense and the effort of supervising Reconstruction in the post-war South. The Freedmen's Bureau just fell victim to a broader sense that Reconstruction was too costly, it was too distracting, and people in the North had grown more interested in things like expansion westward and economic issues than they were in continuing to pursue nation building in the former Confederacy. So the Freedmen's Bureau, for all of its success, for all of its significance, it died too early and it fell victim to the broader issues that led to the demise of Reconstruction. Abraham Lincoln and his supporters were concerned that the Emancipation Proclamation would be seen as a temporary war measure. So, they supported the 13th Amendment as a means to guarantee the permanent abolition of slavery. It was followed by the 14th Amendment, which intended to protect the civil rights of former slaves. After Abraham Lincoln's assassination in 1865, his vice president, Andrew Johnson, rejected Lincoln's attitude towards the freedmen. When Andrew Johnson assumed the presidency in 1865, his Reconstruction plan was completely different than Abraham Lincoln's. Johnson believed in states' rights, so he gave the Southerners authorization uh, to control the freedmen's transition from slavery to freedmen. He uh, pardoned a lot of the Southerners with the exception of uh, wealthy plantation owners and Confeder uh, those that were higher up in the Confederacy. Um, and he eventually, uh, well they, eventually received individual pardons. In addition, um, he undermined the efforts of the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, so during that time, the Southerners started to institute black codes. Um, so this Johnson was eventually impeached because of his efforts to undermine the uh, Freedmen's Bureau. 
and the United States House of Representatives drafted 11 articles of impeachment against Johnson, uh, citing him with high crimes and misdemeanors. And even though he was impeached, before he was uh, put out of office, he resigned. So the Black Codes were the laws passed by the Southerners uh, between 1865 uh, and 66, and they were uh, intended to restrict the freedom of the former slaves. So they limited the jobs that they th could work in and forced them into low-wage jobs that where they would incur debt. They also restricted their movements. Of uh, it would be there, there were laws such as not more than five people could congregate at a time or um, you had to be in by a certain time or um, there, were, there was a curfew, you, ha or you had to have a pass. I mean, they were really restrictive laws that weren't much different from slavery. The election of Ulysses S. Grant to the presidency in 1868 convinced a majority of Republicans that protecting the franchise of black male voters was important for the party's future. Congress proposed an amendment banning franchise restrictions on the basis of race, color, or previous servitude. After a difficult ratification fight, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution was passed on March 30, 1870. A politically mobilized African American community joined with white allies in the southern states to elect the Republican Party to power, which brought about radical changes across the South. What happened? Well, now they tell me to the uh, yell for the folk know that uh, they were free. I when they found out they were free, they went down here to tell me. Went down here, didn't let. Sharecropping was um, a system that was put in place to. It really gave all of the power to the landowner. So how sharecropping worked is you would basically you were a tenant on the plantation or farm for the land that you were working and you received everything ahead of time in credit like when we think about it uh, former slaves they didn't have money so they couldn't get credit they aside from the freedmen's bank they wouldn't have been accepted in a bank so everything that they did they relied on credit so i would have to trust the landowner to be honest i can't read i can't write so that would end up as a landowner i'd have the opportunity to charge whatever i want be it interest or not and it um so at the end of the season how you were intended to make your money was against the value of the crop. The problem is it never evened out. It was a per, per, uh, perpetual, they were perpetually in debt. So once again, although it was legal and they were technically free, they were still, at this time, they were a slave of the debt. So. It, it was basically freedom in name only. People taking down Confederate statues and, and basically you know, tearing everything that stands for the South, we're tired of it. They're preaching to our kids in schools, these black savages are equals. They're our brothers and sisters. I tell them they're crazy. We're white people. We're standing up for our white rights. The Klan is the only organization that stands up for the white rights. Former Confederates also formed uh, secret organizations uh, as a means of intimidation to keep uh, the former slaves in their place.
uh, some 200,000 black men fought in the Union Army, and Lincoln and Grant and other people said the, war, we couldn't, the Union could not have won that war without the help of these 200,000 or so black soldiers who, who fought in the war. And uh, as a result of that, at the end of the war, radical Republicans like Charles Sumner, that is Stevens, and uh, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman fought for and achieved the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and civil rights bills, the strongest civil rights bills ever passed in this country, bar none. Because of that, uh, uh, black people had this moment of power for about 10 years, from about 1867 to 1877. They elected the first black governor, uh, were responsible for electing the first black governor, PBS Pinchbank back in, in Louisiana, the first black lieutenant governors. Uh, that, was, that was a majority, a black majority in the South Carolina legislature. All this happened in the 10 years between 1867 and 1877. And uh, then in, in, in a reactionary period remarkably similar to this period, uh, they were driven from power and they were systematically uh, uh, disenfranchised, etc. So, in 1876, the last great election of that period, uh, when the revolution occurred in 1876, then in 1877, there was a compromise, what they call the Compromise of 1877. And white Northerners and white Southerners agreed to, 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 to ignore the 13th, 14th, I mean, 14th and 15th Amendment. And we were driven back towards slavery. And as a result of that, uh, sharecropping was, was, was installed, initiated, and we did not really get out of this period until the great uh, freedom movement of the middle of the 20th century. But the compromise of 1877 is for me the, 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 a major marking point of African American history in this country. Men like James Warren English, mayor of Atlanta from 1881 until 1883, owned the Chattahoochee Brick Company, which manufactured many bricks used to construct Atlanta streets. Former Confederate uh, soldier, um, he believed in slavery. I mean, he was about as racist as you can get. And he profited off of indentured servitude. And what that meant is for if you, if you, um, vagrancy laws were a big part of the black codes. So with vagrancy, you could be charged for a crime for just walking down the street. They would charge you, oh, you're a vagrant. And uh, as part of the crime, you would have to pay for your time in jail. Of course you don't have the money to pay the fine so you would then have to work off that debt and James English really took advantage of that system of, of um, that penal system as Douglas Blackman wrote it was slavery by another name I mean he was literally known to buy and sell lots of convict like in groups and he produced about 200,000 bricks a day. It was brutal work. I mean, they were working in the uh, sun. Uh, the guards were basically overseers. They, they would beat the slaves, uh, not slaves, I'm sorry. They would beat these prisoners to uh, death sometimes. Um, at one point, one of his competitors actually complained because Mr. English was able to dominate the industry because he was using this slave labor and uh, the testimony of guards is really deep. Um, they testified how they were fed rancid food or how you could hear the beatings like within miles of the facility or the, the place where they were manufacturing uh, bricks and James English himself has been quoted as saying that the work was heavy the work was hard and it was nothing that a white man could do
Beginning in the 1770s, increasing numbers of African slaves converted to evangelical Methodist and Baptist faiths. So they're saying white, the white people were almost mocking Christianity by saying you should be loyal to your um, to your master, yeah, to your master. And but what did black Bible people start? doing out of that because doesn't it oh they start um having secret church meetings and stuff. so they did they were teaching themselves right yeah During the Great Awakening, Baptist preachers had traveled throughout the South, converting both whites and blacks free and slave. In 1773, David George, Jesse Peters Galfin, and six other men formed the first permanent African-American church at Silver Bluff, South Carolina. Slaves David George, Jesse Peters, and George Lyle organized the refugees into a church in Savannah. After the war, Jesse Peters Gal returned to Silver Bluff and slavery and formed the Springfield Baptist Church, home to the oldest African-American congregation in the U.S. In 1894, Black Baptists formed the National Baptist Convention, an organization that is currently the largest black religious organization in the United States. Like their Baptist counterparts, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, founded by Richard Allen, was noted for its large formal churches, its educational network of schools and colleges, and its vast publishing arm that included several publications by the end of the century. Richard Allen is an American hero. He was a pioneer, and he blazed a trail for future generations to follow. He was the first African-American leader to lead through nonviolence. Richard Allen was born in 1760, a slave to Benjamin Chu of Philadelphia. When he was seven years old, Chu separated Allen from his family and sold him to Stokely Sturgis in Delaware. Your mother has already been sold. You've been separated from beloved family members. You're working long, grueling days. You look around you and all you see is slavery and bondage and hardship. At age 17, he joined the Methodist Society, which met in the woods around the Sturgis farm. That was really the foundational moment in his life when he meets these Methodist ministers who are you know, going through Delaware and preaching the gospel and his life is converted. He's literally changed. The explanation of scriptures helped inform his understanding of who he was as a man. God certainly didn't make him to be bound. When he was 26, Allen and his brother purchased their freedom, agreeing to pay $2,000 over five years. Allen traveled first to Radnor and then to Philadelphia where he became the early morning preacher at St. George's United Methodist Church. The Methodist Church was still very equal in the way that it treated everyone. It was not uncommon to find a black slave, for example, preaching to white slave owners. His presence and message brought in many new members. As Allen's following grew, white church leaders began segregating African Americans in the balcony during services. He marches to the pews that he thinks he belongs in, and one of the white leaders starts walking down the aisle to where Absalom Jones, the senior member of the black community, is praying on his knees, and he says, get up, get up. You go to the back of the church. You don't belong here. And Alan is watching this from the side. If he tells Absalom Jones to get up and white parishioners don't stop him, we leave. If he tells Absalom Jones to get up and white parishioners say, sit down, he's equal, we stay. 
but the white parishioners were silent, and Allen and Jones led the black congregation out of St. George's. Walking out of St. George's Church is the beginning of civil rights movements in American society. That was really the moment that Allen wanted and had been waiting for. He opened the doors of his own church at 6th and Lombard Streets, the Bethel Church. The idea of a free, independent African church under its own control uh, was a very powerful symbol that many blacks throughout the country latched onto, which is also what made it a threat. For those who were bound to the institution of slavery, uh, the last thing you wanted was somebody like Richard Allen out there meeting behind closed doors and nobody knew what he was saying. Allen would use his church to further the cause of equality, operating a station on the Underground Railroad and supporting civic associations to help blacks deal with an increasingly hostile and racist America. By the early 19th century, powerful forces were trying to undermine Richard Allen. Slavery is expanding in the South, and slaveholding interests are trying to resettle free blacks like Allen in African colonies. White Methodists continued to claim ownership and control over Allen's congregation until 1816, when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that Allen's church would remain independent. That same year, Allen united five congregations to create the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the first autonomous African-American religious denomination in the United States. This is not simply a white man's republic. No one else in the white founding group of Washington, Madison, Adams is talking in those terms. That's why Allen's so important. He comes along and pierces their thoughts and shows them at least tries to show them that this is a contradiction, that you can't have an empire of liberty without black freedom. Churches became centers of a community activity beyond spirituality. Religious growth fueled Southern black literacy from 5% in 1870 to approximately 17% by 1900. As in the North, churches promoted the rise of many African-American leaders who worked well outside the sphere of church in politics, education, and other professions. These African-American church leaders recognized the importance of what they were doing for the community. They wrote histories, biographies, memoirs, and other accounts of religious life in the South during this era. It is through these written texts that we still have access to the many voices that comprise the first century of the black church in the United States. One of my favorite documents, it was petitioning Congress for compensation, asking for $7,000 for uh, destruction of the uh, church by a uh, new troop by General Sherman. I'm Reginald Washington, I'm a senior archivist in the National Archives here in Washington, D.C. The document lists 234 members of the uh, congregation. Some of the uh, names have X's between the first and the surname, and that indicates that the person couldn't read or write. And some of the other names are certainly written out, so it suggests to me that there were both free blacks and slaves as congregants in the church. To the Honorable Senate and House Representatives, during the late campaign of General Sherman through Georgia, our house of worship was torn down to the ground and utterly demolished by a party of federal soldiers. It was very moving, very moving uh, narrative, and uh, certainly it's something that uh, just fascinated me as I uh, continued to do research. It was a large, commodious, and well-finished edifice that had been built by ourselves when in slavery. It was to us what the temple was to the Jews. It, it raised several questions for me. First, the question was whether they got paid whether they were compensated for their loss. Uh, secondly, was whether the church exists today. As almost all of us have been slaves all our lives, we are without pecuniary means to build another house of worship. Most of us are struggling for dear life. Within the text of the document, it mentions that it's the colored Methodist Episcopal Church of Atlanta. But there's no reference to that church name in the index of the Court of Claims. I decided that let's take a look and see if the church claim was resubmitted by an individual. Two people came to mind. The pastor of the church, 
Joseph A. Woods. We looked under Joseph A. Woods. He wasn't there in the index. But we did find a, a claim under Robert Webster, who was listed as the chairman of the trustee board. And looking at the, the case file for um, Robert Webster, he had made claim for some mules and horses and some tobacco that had been taken from him uh, uh, by Union forces. One of his witnesses was a Joseph Wood. Joseph A. Wood, being called and sworn, said, I am a minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I had charge of Big Bethel for two years. We went back to the indexes. There was a reference for the Big Bethel AME Church. Same claim, same church. This is a letter from uh, Wesley J. Gaines, who is now the pastor of the church. And he's writing to the Freedmen's Bureau to find out uh, information about the initial claim that was filed uh, in 1866. Letters dated uh, April 30th, 1868. I have the honor to request that an application be made to the proper authority to pay to the trustees of the AME Church of Atlanta the value of their house of worship, which was destroyed by the Union Army during its occupation of Atlanta. The Court of Claims collected the evidence and determined it probably wasn't worth $7,000. The reasonable value of the church building was the sum of $900, no part of which appears to have been paid. The church had been used uh, before the Union troops arrived as a Confederate hospital. If it was destroyed by federal troops, indeed, then it was, an, it was by an act of war. When the dark days of war had passed, and we gathered again here from our wanderers, our holy and beautiful house was a massive ruin. 1915, there was introduced in Congress a huge omnibus bill that was going to deal with those persons or those institutions that had filed claims uh, for compensation during the Civil War. No compensation was ever made. factories had been destroyed by the war. At the same time, there was no capital or cash in the post-war Confederacy. The Confederate currency was worthless. And so it, it would take a long time for the South to recover its economic growth and also its social and political stability. During the 1870s and 1880s, however, a number of civic and corporate leaders in the South began to talk about what they called the New South. And they promoted this vision of a New South. And what they meant by that was that the Old South, that is the South before the Civil War, was dominated by the cotton economy. And the, and the South was too preoccupied with its agricultural sector at the expense of developing its own industry, its own factories, its own mills. And as a result, the South did not have a diversified economy. So the New South, the proponents of the New South, wanted the post-war South to develop a diversified economy just as was the case in the Northeast. So they promoted the development of Southern industry, Southern factories, Southern textile mills. And at the same time, they developed, uh, they promoted the development of a, a southern agriculture that was not solely focused on cotton, but was more diversified with, with all sorts of crops. They also assumed that the New South that they were promoting would include uh, stable race relations between whites and blacks. This ideal, this myth of the New South became commonplace in, in the major cities of the South, in Atlanta, in Richmond, in New Orleans. They were all, there were all advocates of the New South in those cities. But unfortunately, the dynamics of the situation in the post-war South were such that the New South never really emerged during the last quarter of the 19th century. Yes, there was a little bit of industrial development and, and the growth of mills, and there was some uh, diversification of Southern agriculture, but never to the extent that was envisioned by the promoters of the New South. The foremost promoter of the New South ideal was the editor of the Atlanta newspaper, a man named Henry Grady. And he gave very impassioned speeches, not just in the South, but also in New York and the Northeast, talking about his dream 
of a South that would be more diversified in its economy and more harmonious in its race relations. That dream did not appear during Henry Grady's lifetime, but ironically, a hundred years later, in the 1970s and the 1980s, the New South did emerge with the dramatic economic growth in the so-called Sunbelt states of the South and the Southwest, and the surge of prosperity and migration into the South, and the diversification of the Southern economy, it finally came to pass in the 1980s as opposed to the 1880s. The 1895 Cotton States International Exposition was held at the current Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Georgia. Nearly 800,000 visitors attended the event. The exposition was designed to promote the region to the world and showcase products and new technologies, as well as to encourage trade with Latin America. The Cotton States and International Exposition featured exhibits from several states, including various innovations in agriculture and technology. President Grover Cleveland presided over the opening of the exposition, but the event is best remembered for both held and criticized Atlanta Compromise speech given by Booker T. Washington on September 18th, promotion, promoting racial cooperation. The sentiment of the masses of my race when I say that no way have the value and manhood of the American Negro been more fittingly and generously recognized than by the managers of this magnificent exposition at every stage of its process. It is a recognition that will do more to cement the friendship of the two races than any occurrence since the dawn of our freedom. Not only this, but the opportunity here afforded will awaken among us a new era of industrial progress. Ignorant and inexperienced, it is not strange that in the first years of our new life we began at the top instead of the bottom that a seat in Congress or the state legislator was sought more than real estate or industrial skill, that the political convention or the stump speaking had more traction than starting a dairy farm or truck garden. A lost ship at sea for many days suddenly sighted a friendly vessel. From the mast of unfortunate vessel has seen a signal, water, water, we die of thirst. The answer from the friendly vessel at once came back, cast down your bucket where you are. I moved to the West Side at age 15, and although I'd been taught the history of downtown Atlanta in school, my perception of my new neighborhood was largely based on what the media portrayed. So I, like most people, could only see the poverty, the crime, and the remnants of a great history that was long behind us now. It wasn't until I attended Spelman College that my entire perspective shifted. It may be hard to believe, but in those 18 years as a black woman, I had never understood how deeply race played a part in my life. But on those commutes to school, crossing over streets named Joseph E. Boone and Joseph Lowry and a host more in between, brought me face to face with reality. These experiences pushed me to understand the value of the historic West Side as truly an incubator for the black movements that shaped my social position in the world. It forced me to think critically about the weight of economic disparity in all communities of color. And it compelled me to stare at my own biases in the face and obligate myself to creating change with and for my neighbors like the leaders before me. All right, look. Read this time. Hall of Fame, Alexa Universe. Did you say Hall of Fame? No, my bad. Or Hall. Where? Alexa Universe. Where? Where Hall? Where Hall? My bad. Where Hall? Yes, Atlanta University. So Atlanta University is the first. Uh, it's the first college in the country for Black people where they could get advanced degrees, like where you could get a master's or...
The school is named after Edmund Asa Ware. Edmund Asa Ware was a missionary. And he worked for um, the American Mission Society as well as the Freedmen Bureau. So he went throughout the South uh, starting school for black people. And when they started Atlanta University, it actually started. Remember that big church we went to, Friendship Baptist Church? To my doing with the road and go to? Yeah. Edmund A. Sawyer was an integral part of the founding of the HBCUs in Atlanta. As a um, as superintendent of the American uh, Missionary Association and also a superintendent of the Freedmen's Bureau, his job was to go around and try to start schools for the freedmen. So he, along with uh, he assisted Frank Quarles actually with Friendship Baptist Church. He secured uh, through donations in Ohio, he was able to get a boxcar. Half of the boxcar, um, I don't even know if they did it half and half. I would imagine that uh, part, of, part of the time it was dedicated to schooling and part of the time it was dedicated to church. The school that they started um, was primary initially it was the score school but uh, it became Atlanta University and the church that uh, was started eventually became Friendship Baptist Church uh, and that was also how they started First Congregational Church. When Booker T. Washington gave his speech, it was referred to or commonly called the Atlantic Compromise Speech. And uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a professor at that time at Atlanta University, was, they were really butting heads. Like he did not agree with that accommodationist attitude. He felt uh, that uh, African Americans or slave free, it didn't matter. They were fully entitled to all of the rights as any white person. He did not believe that it was something that they should earn, but something that they were entitled to. And um, he pushed ed uh, education, whereas Booker T. Washington believed in education, but he was primarily concerned with vocational training. And out of that disagreement, so to speak, came um, Watt entered into the uh, Paris Exposition and what he wanted to do with the exposition was showcase how far the African American or black race had come from slavery. In uh, 1897, I went to Atlanta University and stayed there 13 years making a systematic study of the American Negro which wasn't well done because we didn't have money enough or personnel to carry it out but nevertheless it's fair to say that for the next 25 years there wasn't a book published on the Negro problem that didn't have to depend upon what we were doing at Atlanta University. It was the first study of the sort. Ours was the first institution in the United States white or black, 
that had any course on the history of the American Negro or on Negro history in general. So that it was a good beginning. But while I was there, my faith in knowledge as a solution of the Negro problem was shaken. Uh, lynching was common. Before I went away from there, there was an average of one lynching every week. So why are we here? Uh, I think it's important to understand that there was um, like just what, maybe 40 plus years after the end of slavery, black people had built a considerable well, there, there was an emerging middle class in the city of Atlanta, and a lot of it was tied to the uh, four colleges, really by the institutions. Like uh, Alonzo Herndon, his wife was actually a teacher at Atlanta Life. And if you think about it, he came up from slavery. Uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, he was still enslaved. So if you come to 1906, or I think he's he built this house in maybe 1910s. So right around the 1900s, he was becoming more and more prominent because he owned a string of barber shops. Uh, and that was a problem for the white power structure. There, um, there was this growing resentment. And in 1906, there was a governor's race. And the race was between Polk Smith, the head of the Atlanta Journal, and Clark Howell, the head of, or maybe at the time he was the editor, of the Atlanta Constitution. So what they did is similar a lot of times to what we see in politics today. I think that's why black people recognize it, like, aha, that's what they're doing, because they were race babies. The way that they thought they would get vote, votes was to, um, push this idea that, you know what, these black people, we need to put them back in their place. Like, we need to preserve our, and here's another key word for uh, people of color, we need to uh, hold to our southern heritage, those rights. These things are getting out of hand. So, uh, they actually campaign on the idea of disenfranchising the black vote. Um, and at the same time, they would do that by, by pushing the idea that the streets were no longer safe, that, uh, that crime was rampant and out of hand. And what they did was say that black people, or men in particular, were uh, frequenting these saloons on downtown on Decatur Street. So if you think about the area where uh, Georgia State is today, there used to be a lot of saloons there that were frequented by people of color, uh, particular, particularly men. And it was something that wasn't really popular with the black middle class or the elite, so to speak, either. Um, so one day, a rumor started spreading of a woman being attacked by one of these saloon lords, and that is what sparked the riot.
Starting as Augusta Institute under the first president, Dr. Joseph T. Robert, the institution was created to educate black men for careers in ministry and teaching. It was at the urging of Frank Quarles that the school moved to Atlanta's Friendship Baptist Church in 1879 and changed its name to Atlanta Baptist Seminary. The seminary moved to downtown Atlanta and then in 1885 to a former Civil War battleground site in Atlanta's West End under President Dr. Samuel T. Graves. By 1897, the institution had become Atlanta Baptist College. It was during the tenure of the college's first African-American president, John Hope, that the college was renamed Morgan Morehouse College in 1913 in honor of Henry L. Morehouse, corresponding secretary of the National Baptist Home Missionary Society. The institution is the top producer of black males who continue their education and receive doctorates in education, life and physical sciences, math and computer sciences, psychology and social social sciences, as well as humanities and the arts. Morehouse currently has more than 17,000 alumni representing more than 40 states and 14 countries. What is your name? My name is Ron. Uh, what is it? Ron. Ron. What's your class of, well, no, we can share. What's your classification? Freshman. Oh, okay. And uh, where are you from? From D.C. Oh. And where are you from? Uh, from Denver, Colorado. Oh, Denver. And what's your name? Tahir. Tahir. And you're a freshman, too? Yeah. You know how I could tell y'all freshmen? Because it's Saturday and y'all still on campus. Oh, we leave the campus. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm stopping progress. So how did you choose Morehouse? So um, it was between Hampton, Howard, and Morehouse. Because uh, my family, they went to uh, Howard. Uh -huh. And I came down here and I just liked it. Opening a school just for African Americans was really radical. Then you also have to layer on that the gender issues, and so the whole country, most women in most women in general were not. Uh, uh, there, nobody advocated for them to have education. The Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary was established on April 11, 1881, in the basement of Friendship Baptist Church by Harriet Giles and Sophia Packard, two teachers from the Orient Institute of Worcester, Massachusetts. The two of them traveled to Atlanta specifically to found a school for black freed women and found support from Frank Corals. The school opened with 11 students and within three months enrollment grew to 80 and additional teachers were sent by the Women's American Baptist Home Mission. The American Baptist Home Mission Society provided a down payment for a new campus at the former barracks of the Union Army. In need of additional funds, in 1882, Giles and Packard had an opportunity to meet with John D. Rockefeller at the Wilson Avenue Baptist Church in Cleveland. His wife, Laura Spellman Rockefeller, and her sister, Lucy, were alumna of Oread and previously met Packard and Giles on a visit in 1864. Impressed by their mission, the Rockefellers visited the school in 1884 on the school's third anniversary. The debt on a new school campus was discharged by the Rockefellers and the school was renamed Spelman Seminary for women and girls in the honor of Laura Rockefeller's parents. Currently, Spelman is ranked among the nation's top liberal arts colleges. Because I pose that question to myself, why in the 107 years of the history of this historically black college for women there had not been an African-American woman president. I asked myself that question and came up with the answer that there were actually many women, many African-American women who could have done it. Our society had made the mistake of not giving them a chance. And so what that does is to give you a sense of enormous responsibility. Because what you're really doing is carrying out this job, not just for yourself, 
but for all of those sisters who were denied the opportunity to do so when they were really quite prepared. Hers was Clark, so they moved over here. Clark used to be in So, y'all share some of the history in that you all uh, started in the basement at Friendship. Well, actually, uh, Atlanta University started in a railroad car. Wow. So the answer is no, y'all <laughs> A sparsely furnished room in Clark Chapel, a Methodist Episcopal Church in Atlanta's Summer Hill section, housed the first Clark College class. In 1871, the school relocated to a new site on the newly purchased White Hall and McDaniel Street property. In 1877, the school was chartered as Clark University. In 1883, Clark established a theology department named for Dr. Elijah H. Gammon, the Gammon School of Theology. In 1888, Gam Gammon became an independent theological seminary. It's part of the Interdenominational Theological Center. We're second semester freshmen. Yes. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm from Illinois. That second semester is important, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, how'd you choose Clark? Well, me, I already knew that my major was going to be mass media art, so I was looking up, and I already knew I wanted to go to an HBCU, so I was looking up HBCUs and what's really popping in mass media. And because I'm not going to lie, I always wanted to go to Spelman for the name, but Spelman did not have my major. So Clark had it, so I did my research on Clark. I came and visited, and I just felt like this was the place for me. And what about you? Um, yeah, so I'm from Illinois, so you know, there's not like any HBCUs out there. So I knew I wanted to go to one, and then I really like Atlanta, you know, for the dancing, I like to dance, and I just like the art. So yeah, I just came here and visited. I was like, yeah, this is just the school for me. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Thank nice you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. If you ever understand, if you ever understand, institution of Marsh we all under the umbrella of the African Methodist Episcopal Church is a state six Episcopal District Episcopal Districts that uh -huh. is the model okay in almost every Episcopal District there is a college and each college has a theological uh, seminary attached to it. Okay. So there are six colleges. Also, we have, they're not only here in the United States, we have them in other places as well. Okay. At the North Georgia Annual Conference of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, it was decided that an institution fully supported and operated by African Americans in the South for the education of African American young men and women should be established in Atlanta. A board of trustees was appointed to foster the organization. In May 1885, a charter was granted for Morris Brown College. That October, the college was open for reception of students under the principalship of Miss Mary McCree. 
Morris Brown was named for the second bishop of the AME Church and opened its doors to 107 students representing a broad array of age and grade levels. The school relied largely on small donations to survive the lean years that followed its founding. To prepare students for ministerial careers in the AME Church, Morris Brown opened a theology department in 1894, which became the Turner Theological Seminary in 1900. The seminary's name honors Henry McNeil Turner, a pioneering AME Church organizer. In 1932, the school's trustees allowed Morris Brown to occupy Atlanta University's former grounds in the Vine City neighborhood of Atlanta. When Dolores Cross arrived on campus in 1999 to shore up the school's finances, she embezzled millions of dollars in federal student aid. Authorities revoked Morris Brown's accreditation, making it ineligible for membership in the AUC. Cross and the school's financial aid director pled guilty to fraud. Based on financial management, and once you don't have accreditation, then you can't get financial support from the government and other opportunities, and that led to the to the kind of downhill slope that we're on. Maserati, Maserati, Maserati.